History and Freedom uh, by Theodore Adorno. This is lecture 15 on interpretation, the concept of progress, 1. Uh, January 12th, 1965. Last time I had begun to tell you about the transition from philosophy to the concept of interpretation. Today I should like to finish off what was inevitably an all too cursory account of that transition before moving on to establish a bridge between the two parts of these lectures. And of course, there is no need to explain to wily dialecticians like yourselves that this bridging exercise does not create a link between the two parts, but must affect a mediation within the two parts themselves. If you reflect on what I have said to you about philosophical interpretation, you will perhaps be able to see why I have placed such great emphasis upon the theory of natural history. It is because this interweaving of nature and history must in general be the model for every interpretative procedure in philosophy. We might almost say that it provides the canon that enables philosophy to adopt an interpretive stance without lapsing into pure randomness, for it retains the polarity that is essential to philosophy, that is to say the combination of the stringent, the authoritative, with the element of living experience or expression, even though these two elements can never harmonize entirely. The fragmentation of philosophy into so-called schools of rationalism or empiricism that are constantly at loggerheads with each other has as its background the insoluble nature of this tension behind which the insoluble problem of dissolving non-identity into identity may well lie. The relationship of nature and history provides us with a primal image of interpretive, interpretative behavior, something that has been handed down through intellectual history in the form of allegory. It is hardly a coincidence that the first philosophy to have emphasized the concept of, of interpretation and to have developed it as a methodological principle on a larger, large scale was that of the middle and later Schelling, who himself who himself made extensive reference to allegory, a concept that has since fallen into disfavor in aesthetics. Beneath this gaze, the profound gaze of allegory, which is perhaps the model for the philosophical gaze as such, because the attitude of melancholic contemplation may well be the attitude on which philosophical inquiry has been founded, nature stands revealed. Nature, I say, reveals itself beneath this gaze as history, Just as in all allegory, the death's head owes its central importance to the fact that as a natural object, its own expression reveals its historical nature. Conversely, I would remind you here of the passage from Benjamin's writings that I read out or that I read out to you in one of the recent lectures. Beneath this gaze, history stands revealed as nature insofar as it turns out to be permanent transients. Moreover, the recollection of the past, the memory in the phenomenon itself is the mode of behavior, or what we might almost, or what we might almost, following Holderlin, call the scheme according to which interpretation can take place. At the same time as a form of melancholy which perceives transience and everything historical, this attitude is also critical. We might even say in general that the transition from philosophy to criticism represents something like a secularization of melancholy. This is a melancholy that has become active, not a melancholy that makes do, that remains stuck fast in an unhappy consciousness, not at home with itself, but a consciousness that exteriorizes itself as a critique of existing phenomena. Such a melancholy is probably the preeminent critical philosophical stance. In other words, if you read the phenomena of history as the ciphers of their own transience or their own natural deterioration, they will always, they will also always always be defined by their own negativity. This element of negativity is the element of criticism in philosophy. Interpretation and critique come together at a profound level. This explains why I find it foolish to demand that we should first understand a thing and only then criticize it. For since the process of understanding and interpreting entails negation, a consciousness of the imminent demise of a phenomenon is at one with the criticism of what the world has done to it. In general terms, we might say that interpretation means reading nature from history 
and history from nature. Interpretation teases out of the phenomena, out of second nature, out of what has been mediated, out of the world around us that has been mediated by history and society, the fact that they have evolved, in just the same way as it shows that there can be no evolution without the process being convicted of its own naturalness, while the evolution itself, mediation, must be understood as a prolonged state of immediacy, a natural condition. The two aspects belong together. You may say that each is present in the other. In other words, nature is present in history as transience, a proposition I spent the entire first part of these lectures explaining to you. Conversely, we shall also be able to say that history is present in nature as something that has evolved and is transient. At the same time, however, because these two aspects are indissolubly linked, every interpretation is also posited. And I believe that anyone who, like me, emphasizes the standpoint of imminent interpretation and criticism is obliged to refrain from making a fetish of this imminence. For in order to liberate this imminence, to appropriate its power, we need the knowledge of what is other. This means that the deep melancholic gaze of which I have spoken will be able to discover the element of becoming or of having become in what has evolved only if it can bring to the contemplation of phenomena the consciousness of that process of becoming. In my writings, I have illustrated this with an example from Holderlin, and I would like to refer you to his poem, The Shelter at Heart, the meaning of which only becomes completely clear when you understand its specific references. The fact that this was the allegorical place where, the, where Duke Ulrich or Württemberg is reputed to have hidden while making his escape and that, according to Holderlin, the place itself is made to speak of this. Only when you know this is it possible to understand the poem completely, whereas this reference to Duke Ulrich, as Frederick Beisner has explained it, has some of the disturbed character that people were more likely to see in Holderlin's poems than their specific content. On the other hand, however, this vanishing of history into nature that we have seen in Holderlin's poem is also an element of expression assumed by nature. This means that only because these pragmatic historical elements have disappeared, only because the poem has acquired this enigmatic character, has, ex has it succeeded in assuming the expression of transience that points beyond itself and constitutes its greatness. I should like to ask you all to read The Shelter at Heart, this later poem of Holderlin Holderlin's, there is, I believe, no better model for what I mean by the interlocking of nature and history in a phenomenon, in this instance, from the realm of poetry. Interpretation, I said, is criticism of phenomena, that I have been brought to a standstill. It consists in revealing the dynamism stored up in them, so that what appears a second nature can be seen to be history. On the other hand, criticism ensures that what has evolved loses its appearance as mere existence and stands revealed as the product of history. This is essentially the procedure of Marxist critique, if I may briefly make mention of this here. Marxist critique consists in showing that every conceivable social and economic factor that appears to be part of nature is in fact something that has evolved historically. Thus, there is always an element of reciprocity. What appears to be natural is discovered to be historical, while things that are historical turn out to be natural because of their transience. Behind this phenomenon stands the historicized dialectic of subject and object which cannot be reduced to their pure state. To destroy immediacy means dissolving the appearance of naturalness through the critical process. It means demolishing the claim that phenomena that have evolved in time are just what they are in the present. I have not drawn your attention to all the specific arguments in Hegel that have formed starting points for my own remarks, but it seems to me that here Hegel has fallen victim to a certain illusion, inasmuch as he has given his theory of the way in which immediacy constantly reasserts itself in excessively positive reading. He is undoubtedly in the right when he maintains that, in phenomena that have finished evolving, the process of evolution, its history, disappears or, to use the expression of Hegel's that I quoted in these lectures a few hours ago, becomes second nature. 
The more thoroughly this process of evolution disappears, the greater the appearance of a second nature, of sheer natural existence. You need think here only of the realm of pure reason, pure logic. What characterizes logic in the first instance is that the traces of its evolution, that is to say the subjective aspect of synthesis, are scarcely visible any more, and an extreme mental effort is called for if they are to be perceived and retrieved. Having said this, however, which anyway is rendered more or less self-evident by the Hegelian arguments, we should add that this evolved immediacy the second immediacy is still only an illusion. By this I mean that it hides something, that because it is a congealed history it seals off the dynamism contained within itself. The mistake Hegel makes here, if I may speak in this schoolmasterly way, is that because the second nature is impenetrable, he is tempted to place it on the same logical plane as the first. In other words, he is tempted to treat it as something immediate without any reservations, Whereas, precisely because it postulates itself as immediate without actually being so, it inevitably conceals its own history and thus degenerates into ideology. We might even say that, setting aside the familiar but superficial political and ontological distinctions between the two men, this is the real difference between Hegel and Marx. Marx always takes the historical nature of the second, third, and fourth immediacy, that is to say, of second nature, far more seriously than Hegel, who tends simply to accept that something that is evolved then disappears into the evolved reality. So that, for Hegel, all this means is that, with the demonstration of mediation, immediacy ends up at every stage as no more than a piece of subjectivity, as an instance of mind, as something postulated by mind, with Marx, on the other hand, the tendency is for the negativity contained in the very naturalness of immediacy, of a later, mediated, evolved immediacy to come to the surface. He assigns to the reflective mind the task of dispelling this illusion of naturalness, and, in contrast, of uncovering the true reality in the hidden, hidden laws of motion, in what lies concealed, what does not lie on the surface, while the facade shrivels into mere illusion. If it does not sound too pompous, we might say that this is a kind of metaphysical and dialectical interpretation of the relationship between dialectic and ideological critique. Besides, it is not by chance that the sphere of art should be the sphere in which something that is most perfectly thesi, that is to say, something that has become or has been made, presents itself as physi, i.e. as natural. Nor need we be astonished that the sphere of art which is remarkable for the fact that that in it objects that have been created should present themselves as purely immediate, as being should have declared itself to be the realm of semblance, illusion, while actuality, where we find the same encapsulation of the production process as in art, fails to acknowledge its own status as semblance. Indeed, if I may be allowed to exaggerate the position, it is in a sense far more illusory than art, since art turns the relationship between appearance and reality into a focus of attention and gives it expression. Ladies and gentlemen, I have spoken of the joys of interpretation. Now that I am coming to an end of my discussion of this topic, let me say another few words about this. Perhaps what I have said about the joys of interpretation will by now have become a little clearer to you. These joys consist in refusing to be blinded by the semblance of immediacy, and instead in uncovering the process by which the work became what it is, so that we may transcend that semblance. At the same time, they refer to the power of the mind to retain its self-control. In the face of the sorrow that is aroused by the contemplation of the past, Kant had noted in one of the profoundest passages in the aesthetics of the sublime that what a common or garden aesthetics customarily thinks of as aesthetic pleasure is in reality a state in which the mind remains in control of itself in the face of the overwhelming power of nature, in the face of total transience. Thus the joy of philosophy, and philosophy should not deny this pleasure, but shed light on it and make it its own, is connected with the activity of interpretation. In fact, we are capable of experiencing this pleasure only insofar as we are capable of this act of interpreting. When it comes down to it, the source of this pleasure lies in the fact that the phenomena and I mean the phenomena in their most concrete form, the form in which they have all the colorfulness that children desire, 
that children focus upon, for all happiness comes from our childhood. Our pleasure derives from the fact that the phenomena always mean something, uh, something different from what they simply are. Thus, interpretation leads us to break through their surface existence. The deepest promise interpretation makes to the mind is perhaps the assurance it gives that what exists is not the ultimate reality. Or perhaps we should say what exists is not just what it claims to be. We might say then that the negativity of natural history, which always discovers what phenomena used to be, what they have become, and at the same time what they might have been, retains the possible life of phenomena as opposed to their actual existence. In this sense, the interpreted, interpretative stance in philosophy is the prototype of a utopian stance towards thought, and philosophies that remain true to this utopian motif have always had a soft spot for interpretation. Interpretation, in fact, means to become conscious of the traces of what points beyond mere existence, by dint of criticism, that is to say by virtue of an insight into transience and into the shortcomings and fallibility of mere existence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is really all I propose to say to you about the relationship between the philosophy of history and, and interpretation. I should now like to conclude this part of the lecture course by discussing a category that both encapsulates the entire problem of the philosophy of history and also forges a link between it and the theory of freedom. The concept I have in mind is that of progress. I should just like to remind you that Hegel had described history as progress in the consciousness of freedom, and that in Kant's philosophy of history, progress had served as the mediating link between the spheres of necessity and freedom in the sense that the natural antagonism between human beings, the fact that homo homini lupus, man is a wolf to other men, compels people to throw off the mechanism of compulsion and to establish something that might be called a realm of freedom. But instead of attempting to provide a theoretical underpinning of these ideas in the philosophy of history, that I've tried to explain to you, or to synthesize them with the theory of freedom, I would prefer to say something about progress, by way of a conclusion, and so as to give you a somewhat concise idea of this view of history. In order to give an account of the concept of progress, I shall have to subject it to a scrutiny close enough to ensure that it loses its obvious meaning, both positive and negative. After everything I've said about interpretation as the insistence on what phenomena and even concepts say over and above what they do say, this probably does not call for further explanation. We must therefore put the concept of progress under the microscope, microscope, as it were, so as to strip it of its semblance of naturalness, its semblance of being a second nature. But examining it in close-up makes a proper assessment difficult. More even than other concepts, that of progress evaporates as soon as you begin to specify what actually progresses and what doesn't. The more you insist on knowing this, the less remains of the concept. I should like to take advantage of this for a philosophical or conceptual digression. The fact is that the function of nominalism has undergone a far-reaching change. This has to be said if we are to make a meaningful criticism of nominalism. Nominalism is tied to the tradition of enlightenment and the history of enlightenment since the Middle Ages is identical with nominalism. That is to say, it is denied that concepts have a natural existence. And this means that they are to be treated as, as no more than the summation of particular characteristics. In consequence, there has been a growing demand that concepts should be able to give proof of their identity. We must be able to say what a concept means and how it is to be used. I hope that you will all have long since abandoned the vulgar practice you will constantly come across in naive discussions of saying, well, if you want to talk about progress or freedom, you will have to begin by defining what you mean by them. This habit is an extreme distortion of a vulnerable, of a venerable enlightenment motif, and I hope that I have managed to put you off it. It is a distortion because nowadays this nominalist insistence on defining your terms has long since ceased to serve the purpose of stripping concepts of their magic aura, their character as shibboleths. Instead, pedants who insist on doing this deprive others of the use of whatever true substantive elements are contained in concepts of the essential structured aspects of phenomena that lie within concepts. To give you a drastic example of what I mean, you have only to imagine a sociological discussion in which someone makes use of the word class. In no time at all, someone will say that you can no longer use the word class. 
Nowadays, you have to talk about different strata, and these strata have to be defined very precisely, and so forth. It then becomes clear that what used to be an attempt to make more careful distinctions has ended up as the wish to sabotage the critical function of concepts by claiming that their negative aspect simply does not exist. Quite recently, Air Ludwig Marcus published an unfavorable critique of my writings in the Welt der Literatur. In this, he pretended not to know the difference between true consciousness and false, and demanded that I give him a definition. He seemed to be attacking me because I had failed to provide him with such a definition, even though in reality I certainly could give him one. It is a simple matter of distinguishing between truth and ideology, in other words, between, consci between a consciousness that is appropriate to the current state of society and one that conceals it. However, his real motive was not to seek information, but to deny me the use of that distinction with the aid of a farrago of pseudo-epistemological reflections. That is the only thing that forces us into a certain wariness when objections are raised in a nominalist spirit, instead of tackling the substance of the question at issue. That is to say, such, such objections attempt to deny us the use of concept by disputing that the phenomena it covers really constitute a, uni a unity. As an experienced pater famili familias, I would strongly recommend you in such cases to reply to people who demand to know exactly what freedom is, or progress, that they know precisely what these things are, and that, however vague the general notions about such concepts are, they contain a great deal more truth than attempts to evade the concepts and to deny their validity. The best remedy when confronted with such questions, my homemade medicine chest, so to speak, when someone asks what freedom is, is to tell him that he needs only to think of any flagrant attack on freedom. In most cases, this is enough to deflate epistemological exercises that have degenerated into self-justifying sophistry. In the first instance, I am content to be able to say of freedom, by this I mean political freedom, not the free will, that being free means that if someone rings the bell at 6.30 a.m., I have no reason to think that the Gestapo or the GPU are the agents of comparable institutions, or the agents of comparable institutions are at the door and can take me off with them without my being able to invoke the right of habeas corpus. I believe that this is in general the way to deal with objections of this sort. The concept of progress is particularly prone to such acts of sabotage. It dissolves more readily than others as soon as we have to specify what it actually means, what progresses and what does not. Let me say right away that in the case of progress, this has its justification. In other words, there are things that progress and others that do not. I would like to apply this to our reflections on the history of philosophy. In particular, the course of history as a whole thinks of itself as progressive in many respects, and actually is so. Nevertheless, as I believe I have shown, in its natural course it remains constantly the same. The question, therefore, of what is progress and what is not goes to the heart of our reflections about the concept. But whoever wishes to define the concept more precisely risks destroying the very thing he aims at. The subaltern cunning that refuses to speak of progress before we can distinguish between progress in what of what and in relation to what displaces the unity of different elements that constantly modify each other in the concept. This cunning reduces that unity to a mere juxtaposition that is supposed to separate them out from one another in a purifying process of sharp definition. A self-opinionated epistemology that insists on precision where it is not possible to iron out ambiguities sabotages our understanding and helps to perpetuate the bad by zealously prohibiting reflection upon whether progress is taking place or not, a question to which all those caught up in an age of both utopian and destructive possibilities would dearly like an answer. Like every philosophical term, progress has its ambiguities. But, as in every term, these ambiguities testify to a common element. What we should think of progress in the here and now is something we know vaguely, but also quite accurately. I am no friend of Brecht's injunction, one that he often put forward in my conversations with him, that what was wanted was simplification. On the contrary, I believe that it is not for nothing that the term simplification is associated with Jacob Burkhardt's mo about the, ter about the terrible simplificateur. And I believe that whoever wishes to resist totalitarian habits of thought 
must resist the temptation to simplify, but there are quite definite concepts where you cannot get by without a certain measure of simplification if you want to avoid the pitfalls of ideology. It is necessary to employ these concepts with the same simplicity and brutality as the reality to which they refer. We must differentiate as much as we can, but where the bestiality and primitive nature of reality speak, we should take care not to lend them a helping hand by indulging in an excess of differentiation. I can still remember the early days of fascism in Germany, when a sociologist, who later became very famous, sought to persuade me of all sorts of distinctions between fascism and national socialism. I won't even say that these distinctions were wholly lacking in validity, particularly since the two phenomena arose in different societies at different times. But ultimately, these distinctions were superseded by the actions of Hitler and Mussolini, and exposed for what they really are, namely an evasive maneuver. Similarly, today, one of the core stratagems of ideology when you offer a trenchant critique, trenchant critique of something is for people to reply, yes, but things are not really like that. You must take this and that factor into consideration, and they end up wriggling out of it. It is my view that instead of always trying to cut off every individual head of the hydra, we should pay heed to the general principle at work. That is what I mean when I speak of the common factor and the ambiguities of the concept of progress.